Stand by. The vacuum tubes are warming up. This is a special live broadcast. Right here on Georgia Radio. Well, the last few weeks, it seems like the goat man has been a popular topic around Georgia Radio. We talked to Anita Bice as we're celebrating our local authors who uh, wrote that great book about the goat man. And then it got me to thinking, I, in fact, Brother Wade and I were talking the other day, and I said, where, where is the goat man's wagon? Like, it, there's, it's got to be around. And it got me to look, in, and anyway, I found Michael Brown from the Fairbanks Company. You can look them up thefairbankscompany.com up in Rome, Georgia, who has a fascinating story to tell us now. Michael, welcome to the show. Glad you're here. Oh, glad to be here. You are recreating the Goatman's wagon because the Fairbanks Company built the original one probably back in the early 1900s, as best you can tell. Correct. He, uh, he had many wagons over his years of travels. You know, he traveled America for 40 years. And so we, we have identified three of the different wagons he used as Fairbanks baggage wagons. Uh, what makes it unique, the, the Fairbanks company has been in Rome since 1887. And we manufactured baggage wagons from the late 1890s up to the late 1850s. And they would be used on train docks to unload the baggage out of the passenger baggage cars and then bring them up to the where the packagers could get their baggage when they would be uh, commuter stations in each town. And what the, the goat man would do, he would go to a train station and buy a old wagon or trade it out with the people at the, uh, the um, platform there. And... Um, that's how he acquired his wagons because I always wondered, you know, because I saw him when I was about three or four years old and I never forgot seeing him. Yeah, pretty memorable, and, uh, I would imagine, to see this guy yeah, with 30 or 40 goats. Yeah, it was uh, very memorable. I never got out of the car, yeah. but I saw him at uh, this little store in Sugar Valley in North Georgia, and uh, it this, it sat with me. So I... Um, became the president of the Fairbanks Company in 2021. And as we were cleaning out the factory, we found four sets of wheels from the baggage wagons, original wheels. So um, I, I got looking, and I remembered a goat man, so I pulled up the most famous picture of the goat man is um, a picture of him in uh, on our wagon. And, um, With the sign in the his, background, you know, about repenting yeah. and all that. Yeah, all that. Yeah. yeah. Prepare yeah. to meet thy God. Yes. yes. And so um, when I looked at it, I said, oh, wait a minute. That's our wagon. And we've got four of these wheels. So, hmm, this is a good use. So we started the recreation of uh, the wagon. And it took a lot of research to find it because up until the 40s, the Fairbanks Company didn't work off blueprints. Everything would be hand-built. And now, when the, you're saying uh, hand built, you mean like through patterns and whatnot? It, they would through have been, patterns. Yeah. Okay. We, we still had all the original patterns on the wall here, wow. so uh, we went through the original patterns and we found the ones that, because over you know that 50, 60 years of time that the wagon was built, the model changed obviously. So we sort of did. Um, uh, a mixture of wagons to come up with uh, the design because the old style were primarily wood and the newer ones were primarily metal. So we sort of met in the middle around like a 1920, 1930 model wagon. And um, that's the actual wagon that we are building that will be, you know, a tribute to the goat man. And it makes me wonder, I mean, sort of the holy grail of, of wagons here would be the wag, the actual wagon that the goat man used. Now, he used a bunch of them, but, I mean, it would, it would be almost plausible to think that this thing is somewhere around where his school bus is today because his school bus is still down there with a tree growing up through it or whatever. Right. But did you, did you go on a quest to try to find the original or one of them? There was one of them at a National Guard armory. I believe it's either in Virginia or West Virginia. Um, but I read but the not, not the Goat Man's. I mean, it was just another. 
it one was no, it was one of his wagons. Oh, it was. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I read the book, and um, you know, there's several books about the goat man. You just you mentioned one a few minutes ago, but uh, when I was reading the book, it talked about he was going to Washington D.C. to get signed up for his Social Security, and you know the the pro, the the poor goat man got attacked a lot on the road because people thought he was rich. And um, some people theoretically may have set his wagon on fire when he was up there, but one of the wagons survived because there would be a time he would put two wagons together to pull. Sure. And so one of his wagons burnt. The other wagon is was theoretically left at a National Guard armory back in the 60s. Uh, he went to Washington. He came back to Georgia. He bought a new wagon from a train depot down in Atlanta. And he traveled um, up until about 69 or 70 when he, he finally got attacked his last time that, or when he finally decided to leave the road was like in 69 or 70. And he got a couple ribs broke. They killed some of his goats. And he finally decided that's when he moved to that school bus you were mentioning uh, a minute ago. And he decided he wasn't going to stay on the road anymore. And, you know, this guy became just the stuff of legend. I mean, absolute legend. Uh, a tragic oh, life did. in in real and in reality. I mean, it was truly a tragic life. His son was murdered, um, died sort of as a as a local celebrity in Macon at a nursing home down there in the early two thousands. But uh, but he is larger than life today in in the folklore, and the fact we're still speaking about this guy who was an itinerant preacher who rode around on a wagon with towed by goats. Uh, but has left that mark on not only your memory, but thousands and thousands of other folks. You know, so. well, you know that that interesting thing. You know, he was he was comical. He had a joke. He'd say a postcard for a quarter or three for a dollar. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't if you don't think about that for a second, well, now wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And uh, so he he had a good sense of humor. And, you know, you would have had to be, and he had, he had a tree fall on him back during the Great Depression when he was working for the government, and it broke his arm. And back in those days, they didn't set arms correctly, so his arm was cocked out to the side real bad. And uh, so he wasn't really able to do a lot of work due to his um, disfigurement. But uh, he still kept a good attitude, and, um, you know, he always, you know, from everything I've read and all the stories and all the people that we've talked to, uh, he was always positive and kept everything moving in the right direction, no matter what his setback was. Yeah, that's a great lesson to learn. And and today, you're honoring him, uh, not only in the way you're doing this, uh, but but also in the fact that you're doing this and you've got some big plans for this. I, and I, we sort of jumped off here, but you're rebuilding, you're recreating uh, this Fairbanks original, uh, but you're using you're using high school kids to do it. We're working with the local CCA, that's College Career Academy, and uh, I've worked with the interns from there for years trying to develop, you know, the students where they can go on and have good careers when they get out of high school and college. And they've uh, done some of the CAD work with us, and they've uh, the metal shop has made some of the metal parts on the frame. And so we've had them involved uh, throughout the whole process to uh, help us recreate the wagon and next semester, okay, so the goal is the wagon should be complete by June. And uh, when the wagon is complete, the next semester of the fall, we're going to have the uh, fame department at the school. Um, they're going to come in and actually decorate the wagon to look like the goat man's version of it. Because wow. we're building the wagon to a new standard, but then we'll have them decorate it and put the signs. And I've already got a lot of things donated to decorate the wagon, like uh, cast iron skillets and galvanized tubs and chicken baskets. And we've got all the kind of whatnot he would carry on the wagon. And so we want to recreate it to that look. And then the, the bigger play is trying to find the right museum to house the wagon after we get it complete. Yeah. Well, there's so many that come to mind, but I, I just think it's a great idea. And I hope that if, uh, if you're listening to this story and you have some thoughts uh, that you can uh, send over to Michael and his and his company there, the Fairbanks Company, uh, that you would do that because uh, there, and, and who knows what you'll find out there when you start putting a call out for some of this stuff. There might be there might be some Goatman original still floating around out there. You just never know. 
Uh, Michael, how can, how can folks get a hold of you if they have something they want to send to you? You can uh, email me at mbrown at fairbankscatheters.com, mbrown at F-A-I-R-B-A-N-K-S, catheters.com. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we uh, quick link that website and whatnot into the show story and they can uh, they can reach out to you talk to me about the fairbanks company and how you came to work there because that's a fascinating story i'm sure well the the fairbanks company had filed for bankruptcy uh, in the late 20 teens uh, the company's 200 year old company and back in the early 1900s the company had made vows that had used asbestos in the packing so the company filed for bankruptcy and settled out the claims, and a local group of investors bought the company uh, to pay tribute. It's the oldest manufacturer in Floyd County and one of the oldest in the state of Georgia. So to you know, we wanted to keep the history alive of the company and not let it go away due to a lawsuit. So sure. we bought the company. We've been renovating the building and trying to salvage uh, the business and the building because you've had thousands and thousands of employees that worked here over the 130 plus years we've been at this facility in Rome. And uh, we want to pay tribute to them and try to keep something of the history alive for Rome and the state of Georgia. And then you came to work there as a craftsman and a business owner and a a businessman, I should say. Uh, How did did that go? Well, I've got a 30 years of manufacturing experience and um, I wanted to come somewhere where I could see when I retire, I want to be able to see the fruits of my labor. A lot of times you work a job, you don't get to see what actually comes of your effort, but this way I hopefully will be able to set, set this up so the company can live for another 200 years after I'm done. And you're making and, furniture as well. I mean, that's part of it too. We, are, we primarily make material handling equipment, uh, hand trucks, sport trucks. You know, we made the hand trucks used on the Queen Mary. Uh, but <laughs> we've, we've made material handling yeah. equipment. Well, we started making furniture that's called modern industrial furniture, which is based off of a lot of our old table designs and sure. um, uh, material handling platform truck designs. So we try to uh, mix the history of the company and that with the um, with the, the styles of modern industrial furniture that's on the market today. So that's part of it, but our, our primary business is still material handling equipment. I think it's great. If you want a wooden hand truck or dolly that'll last for 200 years, you, you call Michael up and he'll, uh, he'll get it to you. And you still make it the old way, I guess. We make the platform trucks. We still offer all those in wood and metal. Uh, the hand trucks, we only do metal now, but, um, you know, the, uh, we still do the casters. We still manufacture those here in Rome. So it's American made. And, um, you know, we just want to try, like I said, we want to save this company and save manufacturing in America. And, you know, if more people bought American, it would help keep the jobs here. And it's not all that expensive to do that either. I mean, you can, you can oftentimes look around and find something and the quality far outweighs uh, the the, yeah. the price difference, in my opinion, I, that's something that I try to do all the time, and I think it's uh, the sad part is it's harder to do because it's harder to find the stuff. I mean, that's that's the real problem. Where you'll find it's sourced, you know, assembled in America with with parts sourced outside the U.S., which I guess is, you know, uh, a noble a noble idea in itself to try to to do that. But you're making everything right here, uh, which is which is really cool. We, we make most of it. Uh, the frames and the material handling and all that's made here. Some of the wheels and all we import, some of the boats and nuts. Um, you just there's just not a lot of American sources you can buy things anymore. You know, if the um, if the government wants to help American manufacture and they really need to come out with some kind of uh, super low interest loan program for automation and equipment. But you know, if you buy something from Asia you might pay 20 cents on the dollar for what it would cost you to make it here in the United States. And so I understand people trying to save money, but having said that, if we don't start reinvesting in manufacturing in America, we're never going to be independent. We're always going to be relying on someone else to uh, get us the things that we have to have to live day to day. Yeah. So when you go out and you look for that drill that 
you need around the house and you can find the one that's made in America, pay the extra money because you, what you said is so critical. Investing in America and investing in our independence is so critical, especially today yes. where there's so many folks that are doing their dead level best to, to see us go astray. Well, I think it's a great program and you're, you're looking for a home for this thing when it's finished. And uh, of course you're helping keep the history alive. And I love that you said, I didn't get out of the car when I saw the goat man because he was to a, a little person, probably a little alarming, a little scary, maybe. Uh, and, and then now here you are so many years later, uh, devoting a large amount of energy to preserving his memory because he left such a mark on you. He did. And he left such a mark on the South. And I want people to know, cause when the goat man came to town, it was like a carnival or the fair coming to town. You would have everybody from miles and miles around come to hear the goat man preach and see the goat man. Um, I think that's one of the things today people forget. When I was a kid, you had three networks and PBS. Uh, you didn't have satellite with hundreds of channels and you didn't have the internet. So, you know, we got outside and we did stuff. And so somebody like the goat man coming up was a big event for everyone. Well, and a message that stood the test of time, right? Yep. That's right. He Good lived stuff. a simple life. He did what he wanted to do with his life. Um, you know, I find that very noble. Well, amen to that. Michael, I find what you're doing very noble. You can reach out to Michael Brown at the Fairbanks Company. It's the fairbankscompany.com. We'll quick link the other website into the show story as well. Michael, thanks for being here. Thank you very much. I appreciate Country. it. Country, that's what I grew up listening to. Georgia Radio. We love you more than peanuts and peaches. So glad you're here.